Part 4, Chapter 18 of The Marriage of William Ashe by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 4, Chapter 18 The following morning, early, a note was brought to Kitty from Madame Destre. Darling Kitty, would you join us tonight in an expedition? You know that Princess Margarita is staying on the Grand Canal, in one of the Marquenigo palaces? There is to be a serenata in her honour tonight, not one of those vulgar affairs which the whole tales get up, but really good music and fine voices, money to be given to some hospital or other. Do come with us. I suppose you have your own gondola, as we have. The gondolas who wish to follow meet at the piazzetta, weather permitting, eight o'clock. I know, of course, that you are not going out, but this is only music, and for a charity. One just sits in one's gondola and follows the music up the canal. Send word by bearer, your fond mother, Marguerite Destre. Kitty tossed the note over to Ash. Aren't you dining out somewhere tonight? Her voice was listless, and, as Ash lifted his head from the cabinet papers which had just reached him by special messenger, his attention was disagreeably recalled from high matters of state to the very evident delicacy of his wife. He replied that he promised to dine with the prince at Daniele's in order to talk Italian politics. "'But I can throw it over in a moment, if you want me. "'I came to Venice for you, darling,' he said, "'as he rose and joined her on the balcony, "'which commanded a fine stretch of the canal. "'No, no, go and dine with your prince. "'I'll go with Maman, Margaret and I. "'At least Margaret must, of course, please herself.' "'She shrugged her shoulders and then added, "'Maman's probably in the pink of society here. "'Venice doesn't take its cue from people like Aunt Lena.' "'Ash smiled uncomfortably. He was, in truth, by this time infinitely better acquainted with the incidents of Madame Destre's past career than Kitty was. He had no mind whatever that Kitty should become less ignorant, but his knowledge sometimes made conversation difficult. Kitty was perfectly aware of his embarrassment. "'You never tell me,' she said abruptly. "'Did she really do such the dreadful things?' "'My dear Kitty, why talk about it?' Kitty flushed, then threw a flower into the water below with a defiant gesture. "'What does it matter? It's all so long ago. I have nothing to do with what I did ten years ago. Nothing!' "'A convenient doctrine,' laughed Ash. "'But it cuts both ways. You get neither the good of your good nor the bad of your bad.' "'I have no good,' said Kitty bitterly. "'What's the matter with you, milady? said Ash, half scolding, half tender. You growl over my remarks as though you were your own small dog with a bone. Come here and let me tell you the news. And, drawing the sofa up to the open window which commanded the marvellous waterway outside, with its rows of palaces on either hand, he made her lie down while he read her extracts from his letters. Margaret French, who was writing at the farther side of the room, glanced at them furtively from time to time. She saw that Ash was trying to charm away the languor of his companion, by that talk of his, shrewd, humorous, vehement, well-informed, which made him so welcome to the men of his own class and mode of life. And when he talked to a woman as he was accustomed to talk to men, that woman felt it a compliment. Under the stimulus of it, Kitty woke up, laughed, argued, teased, with something of her natural animation. Presently, indeed, the voices had sunk so much and the heads had drawn so close together that Margaret French slipped away, under the impression that they were discussing matters to which she was not meant to listen. She had hardly closed the door when Kitty drew herself away from Ash, and, holding his arm with both hands, looked strangely into his eyes. "'You're awfully good to me, William, but, you know, you don't tell me secrets.' "'What do you mean, darling? You don't tell me the real secrets, what Lord Palmerston used to tell to Lady Palmerston.' "'How do you know what he used to tell her?' said Ash, with a laugh, for his forehead had reddened. "'One hears, and one guesses, from the letters that have been published. "'Oh, I understand quite well. You can't trust me.' Ash turned aside and began to gather up his papers. "'Of course,' said Kitty, a little hoarsely. "'I know it's my own fault, because you used to tell me much more. "'I suppose it was the way I behaved to Lord Parham.' She looked at him rather tremulously. It was the first time since her illness began that she had referred to the incidents at Haggart. "'Look here,' said Ash, in a tone of decision. 
I shall really give up talking politics to you if it only reminds you of disagreeable things. She took no notice. Is Lord Parham behaving well to you now, William? Ash coloured hotly. As a matter of fact, in his own opinion, Lord Parham was behaving vilely. A measure of first-rate importance for which he was responsible was already in danger of being practically shelved, simply, as it seemed to him, from a lack of elementary trustworthiness in Lord Parham. But as to this, he had naturally kept his own counsel with Kitty. He's not the most agreeable of customers, he said gaily, but I shall get through. Pegging away, does it? And then to see how our papers flatter him, cried Kitty. How little people know who think they know. It would be amusing to show the world the real Lord Parham. She looked at her husband with an expression that struck him disagreeably. He threw away his cigarette and his face changed. What we have to do, my dear Kitty, is simply to hold our tongues. Kitty sat up in some excitement. That man never hears the truth. Ash shrugged his shoulders. It seemed to him incredible that she should pursue this particular topic after the incidents at Haggart. That's not the purpose for which Prime Ministers exist. Anyway, we can't tell it him. Undaunted, however, by his tone and with what seemed to him extraordinary excitability of manner, Kitty reminded him of an incident in the life of a bygone administration, when the near relative of an English statesman, staying at the time in the statesman's house, had sent a communication to one of the quarterlies attacking his policy and belittling his character by means of information obtained in the intimacy of a country house party. One of the most treacherous things ever done, said Ash indignantly. Fair fight if you like, but if that kind of thing were to spread, I for one should throw up politics tomorrow. Everyone said it did a vast deal of good, persisted Kitty. A precious sort of good. Yes, I believe Parham in particular profited by it, more shame to him. If anybody ever tried to help me in that sort of way, anybody, that is, for whom I felt the smallest responsibility, I know what I should do. What? Kitty fell back on her cushions, but her eye still held him. Send him my resignation by the next post, and damn the fellow that did it. Look here, Kitty. He came to stand over her, a fine, formidable figure, his hands in his pockets. Don't you ever try that kind of thing. There's a darling. Would you damn me? She smiled at him with a tremor of the lip. He caught up her hand and kissed it. Blow out my own brains, more like, he said, laughing. Then he turned away. What on earth have we got into this beastly conversation for? Let's get out of it. The parms are there, male and female, aren't they? And we've got to put up with them. Well, I'm going to the piazza. Any commissions? Oh, by the way, he looked back at her letter in his hands. Mother says Polly Lister will probably be here before we go. She seems to be touring around with her father. Charming prospect, said Kitty. Does Mother expect me to chaperone her? Ash laughed and went. As soon as he was gone, Kitty sprang from the sofa and walked up and down the room in a passionate preoccupation. A tremor of great fear was invading her, an agony of unfailing regret. What can I do? she said to herself, as her upper lip twisted and tortured at the lower one. Presently she caught up her purse, went to her room, where she put on her walking things without summoning Blanche, and stealing down the stairs so as to be unheard by Margaret, she made her way to the back gate of the palazzo, and so to the streets leading to the piazza. William had taken the gondola to the piazzetta, so she felt herself safe. She entered the telegraphic office at the western end of the piazza, and sent a telegram to England that nearly emptied her purse of francs. When she came out, she was as pale as she had been flushed before, a little terror-stricken figure passing in a miserable abstraction through the intricate backways which took her home. It won't be published for ten days. There's time. It's only a question of money, she said to herself feverishly. Only a question of money. All the rest of the day, Kitty was at once so restless and so languid that to amuse her was difficult. Ash was quite grateful to his amazing mother-in-law for the plan of the evening. As night fell, Kitty started at every sound in the old palazzo. Once or twice she went halfway to the door, eagerly, with hand outstretched, as though she expected a letter. No other English post to-night, Kitty, said Ash at last, 
raising his head from the finely printed poetae minores he just purchased at Ongania's. You don't mean to say you're not thankful? The evening arrived, clear and mild, but moonless. Ash went off to dine with his prince in the ordinary gondola of commerce, hard at the traghetto, while Margaret and Kitty followed a little later in one which had already drawn the attention of Venice, owing to the two handsome gondoliers, habited in black from head to foot, who were attached to it. They turned towards the piazzetta, where they were to meet with Madame Destre's party. Kitty, in her deep mourning, sank listlessly into the black cushions of the gondola. Yet, almost as they started, as the first strokes carried them past the famous palace which is now the Prefecture, the spell of Venice began to work. City of rest, as it seems to our modern senses. How is it possible that so busy, so pitiless and covetous a life as history shows us should have gone to the making and the fashioning of Venice? The easy passage of the gondola through the soft, imprisoned wave, the silence of wheel and hoof, of all that hurries and clatters, the tide that comes and goes, noiseless, indispensable, bringing in the freshness of the sea, carrying away the defilement of the land. The narrow winding ways, now firm earth, now shifting sea, that bind the city into one social whole, where the industrial and the noble alike are housed in palaces, equal often in beauty as in decay. The marvellous quiet of the nights, save when the northeast wind, Hadria's stormy leader, drives the furious waves against the palace fronts in the darkness with the clamour of an attacking host. The languor of the hot afternoons, when life is a dream of light and green water, where the play of mirage drowns the foundations of the Lidi in the lagoon, so the trees and buildings rise out of the sea as though some strong amphion music were but that moment calling them from the deep. And, when day departs, that magic of the swiftly falling dusk, and that white foam and flower of St. Mark's upon the purple intensity of the sky. Through each phase of the hours and the seasons, rest is still the message of Venice, rest enshrined with endless images, impressions, sensations, that cost no trouble and breed no pain. It was this spell of rest that descended for a while on Kitty as they glided downward to the piazzetta. The terror of the day relaxed. Her telegram would be in time, or if not, she would throw herself into William's arms and he must forgive her, because she was so foolish and weak, so tired and sad. She slipped her hand into Margaret's. They talked in low voices of the child, and Kitty was all appealing melancholy and charm. At the piazzetta there was already a crowd of gondolas, and at their head the barca, which carried the musicians. You are late, Kitty, cried Madame Destre, waving to them. Shall we draw out and come to you, or will you join on where you are? For the Vercelli gondola was already wedged into a serried lines of boats in the wake of the barca. Never mind us, said Kitty. We'll tack on somehow. And inwardly, she was delighted to be thus separated from her mother and the chattering crowd by which Madame Destre seemed to be surrounded. Kitty and Margaret bade their men fall in, and they presently found themselves on the salute side of the floating audience, their prow pointing to the canal. The barca began to move, and the mass of gondolas followed. Round them and behind them, other boats were passing and repassing, each with its slim black body, its swan-like motion, its poised oarsman, and its twinkling light. The lagoon towards the Guedecca was alive with these lights, and a magnificent white steamer adorned with flags and lanterns, the yacht indeed of a German prince, shone in the mid-channel. On they floated. Here were the hotels, with other illuminated boats in front of their steps, whence spoiled voices shouted, Santa Lucia! till even Venice and the Grand Canal became a vulgarity and a weariness. These were the serenata publice, common and commercial affairs, which the private serenata left behind in contempt, steering past their flaring lights for the dark waters of romance which lay beyond. Suddenly Kitty's sadness gave way, her starved senses clamoured, she woke to poetry and pleasure. All round her, stretching almost across the canal, the noiseless flock of gondolas, dark, leaning figures impelling them from behind, and in front the high prows and glow-worm lights. In the boats, 
a multitude of dim, shrouded figures with not a face visible, and in their midst the Barca, temple of light and music, built up of flowers and fluttering scarves and many-coloured lanterns, a sparkling fantasy of colour, rose and gold and green, shining on the bosom of the night. To either side, the long, dark lines of thrice historic palaces, scarcely a poor light here and there at their water gates, and now and then the lamps of the Traghetti, otherwise darkness, soundless motion, and overhead dim stars. Margaret, look! Kitty caught her companion's arm in a mad delight. Someone, for the amusement of the guests of Venice, was experimenting on the top of the campanile of St. Mark's with those electric lights which were then the toys of science and are now the eyes and tools of war. A searchlight was playing on the basin of St. Mark's and on the mouth of the canal. Suddenly it caught the church of the Salute, and the whole vast building, from the Queen of Heaven on its topmost dome down to the water's brim, the figures of saints and prophets and apostles which crowd its steps and ledges, the white whirls like huge seashells that make its buttresses, the curves and volutes of its cornices and doorways, rushed upon the eye in a white and blinding splendour, making the very darkness out of which the vision sprang alive and rich. Not a Christian church, surely, but a palace of Poseidon. The bewildered gazer saw naiads and bearded sea-gods in place of angels and saints, and must needs imagine the champing of Poseidon's horses at the marble steps, straining towards the sea. The vision wavered, faded, reappeared, and finally died upon the night. Then the wild beams began to play on the canal, following the serenata, lighting up now the palaces on either hand, now some single gondola, revealing every figure and gesture of the laughing English or Americans who filled it in a hard white flash. Oh, listen, Kitty, said Margaret, someone is going to sing Cefaro. Miss French was very musical, and she turned in a trance of pleasure towards the barca, whence came the first bars of the accompaniment. She did not see, meanwhile, that Kitty had made a hurried movement, and was now leaning over the side of the gondola, peering with arrested breath into the scattered group of boats on their left hand. The searchlight flashed here and there among them. A gondola at the very edge of the serenata contained one figure beside the gondolier, a man in a large cloak and slouch hat, sitting very still with folded arms. As Kitty looked, hearing the beating of her heart, their own boat was suddenly lit up. The light passed in a second, and while it lasted, those in the flash could see nothing outside it. When it withdrew, all was in darkness. The black mass of boats floated on, soundless again, save for an occasional plash of water or the hoarse cry of a gondolier, and in the distance the wail for Eurydice. Kitty fell back in her seat. An excitement from which she shrank in a kind of terror possessed her. Her thoughts were wholly absorbed by the gondola and the figure she could no longer distinguish, for which, whenever a group of lamps threw their reflections on the water, she searched the canal in vain. If what she madly dreamed were true, had she herself been seen and recognised? The serenata, in honour of Italy's beautiful princess, duly made its way to the Grand Canal. The princess came to her balcony, while the jewel song in Faust was being sung below, and there was a demonstration which echoed from palace to palace and died away under the arch of the Rialto. Then the gondolas dispersed. That of Lady Kitty Ash had some difficulty in making its way home against a force of wind and tide coming from the lagoon. Kitty was apparently asleep when Ash returned. He had sat late with his hosts, men prominent in the Risorgimento and in the politics of the New Kingdom, discussing the latest intricacies of the Roman situation and the prospects of Italian finance. His mind was all alert and vigorous, ranging over great questions and delighting in its own strength. To come in contact with these able foreigners, not as the mere traveller but as an important member of an English government, beginning to be spoken of by the world as one of the two or three men of the future, this was a new experience and a most agreeable one. Doors hitherto closed had opened before him. Information no casual Englishman could have commanded had been freely poured out for him. Last but not least, he had at length made himself talk French with some fluency 
and he looked back on his performance of the evening with a boy's complacency. For the rest, Venice was a mere trial of his patience. As his gondola brought him home, struggling with wind and wave, Ash had no eye whatever for the beauty of this Venice in storm. His mind was in England, in London, wrestling with a hundred difficulties and possibilities. The old literary and speculative habit was fast disappearing in the stress of action and success. His well-worn Plato, or Horace, still lay beside his bedside. But when he woke early and lit a candle carefully shaded from Kitty, it was not to the poets and philosophers that he turned. It was to a heap of official documents and reports, to the letters of political friends, or an unfinished letter of his own, the phrases of which had perhaps been running through his dreams. The measures for which he was wrestling against the intrigues of Lord Parham and Lord Parham's clique filled all his mind with a lively ardour of battle. They were the children, the darlings, of his thoughts. Nevertheless, as he entered his wife's dim-lit room, the eager arguments and considerations that were running through his head died away. He stood beside her, overwhelmed by a rush of feeling, alive through all his being to the appeal of her frail sweetness, the helplessness of her sleep, the dumb significance of the thin, blue-veined hand, eloquent at once of character and of physical weakness, which lay beside her. Her face was hidden, but the beautiful hair with its childish curls and ripples drew him to her, touched all the springs of tenderness. It was a loveliness so full, it seemed, of meaning and of promise. Hand, brow, mouth. They were signs of no mere empty and insipid beauty. There was not a movement, not a feature, that did not speak of intelligence and a mind. And yet, were he to wake her now and talk to her of the experience of his evening, how little joy would either get out of it? Was it because she had no intellectual disinterestedness? Well, what woman had? But other women, even if they saw everything in terms of personality, had the power of pursuing an aim steadily, persistently, for the sake of a person. He thought of Lady Palmerston, of Princess Levin fighting Guizot's battles, and sighed. By Jove, the women could do most things if they chose. He recalled Kitty's triumph when the great party gathered to welcome Lord Parham, contrasting it with her willful and absurd behaviour to the man himself. There was something bewildering in such power, combined with such folly. In a sense, it was perfectly true that she had insulted her husband's chief and jeopardised her husband's policy because she could not put up with Lord Parham's white eyelashes. Well, let him make his account with it. How to love her, tent her, make her happy and yet carry on himself the life of high office. There was the problem. Meanwhile, he recognised fully and humorously that she had married a political sceptic, and that it was hard for her to know what to do with the enthusiast who had taken his place. Poor, pretty, incalculable darling. He would coax her to stay abroad part of the parliamentary season, and then perhaps lure her into the country with the rebuilding and refurnishing of Haggart. She must be managed and kept from harm, and afterwards indulged and spoiled and fated to her heart's content. If only the fates would give them another child, a child brilliant and lovely like herself, then surely this melancholy which overshadowed her would disperse. That look, that tragic look, she had given him on the day of the fate, when she spoke of separation. The wild adventure with a lamp had been her revenge, her despair. He shuddered as he thought of it. He fell asleep, still pondering restlessly over her future and his own. Amid all his anxieties, he never stooped to recollect the man who had endangered her name and peace. His optimism, his pride, the sanguine perfunctoriness of much of his character were all shown in the omission. Kitty, however, was not asleep while Ash was beside her, and she slept but little through the hours that followed. Between three and four, she was finally roused by the sounds of storm in the canal. It was as though a fleet of gigantic steamers, in days when Venice knew but the gondola, were passing outside, sending a mountainous wash against the walls of the old palace in which they lodged. In this languid, autumnal Venice, the sudden noise and crash were startling. 
Kitty sprang softly out of bed, flung on a dressing gown and fur cloak, and slipped through the open window to the balcony. A strange sight. Beneath, livid waves lashing the marble walls. Above, a pale moonlight obscured by scudding clouds. Not a sign of life on the water or in the dark palaces opposite. Venice looked precisely as she might have looked on some wild 16th century night in the years of her glorious decay, when her palaces were still building and her state tottering. Opposite, at the traghetto of the Academia, there were lamps and a few lights in the gondolas, and through the storm noises one could hear the tossed boats grinding on their posts. The riot of the air was not cold. There was still a recollection of summer in the gusts that beat on Kitty's fair hair and wrestled with her cloak. As she clung to the balcony, she pictured to herself the tumbling waves on the Lido, the piled storm clouds parting like a curtain above a dead Venice, and behind, the gleaming eternal Alps sending their challenge to the sea, the forces that made the land to the forces that engulf it. Her wild fancy went out to meet the tumult of blast and wave. She felt herself, as it were, anchored a moment at sea, in the midst of a war of elements, physical and moral. Yes, yes, it was Geoffrey. Once, under the skipping light, she had seen the face distinctly. Paler than of old, gaunt, unhappy, absent. It was the face of one who had suffered in body and mind. But she trembled through all her slight frame. The old, harsh power was there, unchanged. Had he seen and recognised her? slipping away afterwards into the mouth of a side canal, or dropping behind in the darkness? Was he ashamed to face her, or angered by the reminder of her existence? No doubt it seemed to him now a monstrous absurdity that he should ever have said he loved her. He despised her, thought her a base and coward soul. Very likely he would make it up with Mary Lister now, accept her nursing and her money. Her lip curled in scorn. No, that she didn't believe. Well, then, what would be his future? His name had been but little in the newspapers during the preceding year. The big public seemed to have forgotten him. A cloud had hung for months over the struggle of races and of faiths now passing in the Balkans. Obscure fighting in obscure mountains. Massacre here, revolt there. And for some months now, hardly an accredited voice from Turk or Christian to tell the world what was going on. But Geoffrey had now emerged, and at a moment when Europe was beginning perforce to take notice of what she had so far and willfully ignored. A lui la parole. No doubt he was preparing it, a bloody, exciting story which would bring him before the footlights again and make him once more the lion of a day. More social flatteries, more doubtful love affairs. Fools like herself would feel his spell, would cherish and caress him, only to be stung and scathed as she had been. The bitter lines of his portrait rung in her ears, blackening and discrowning her in her own eyes. She abhorred him. But the thought that he was in Venice burned deep into senses and imagination. Should she tell William she had seen him? No, no, she would stand by herself, protect herself. So she stole back to bed, and lay there wakeful, starting guiltily at William's every movement. If he knew what had happened, what was she thinking of? Why on earth should he? It would be monstrous to harass him on his holiday with all these political affairs on his mind. Then suddenly, by an association of ideas, she sat up shivering, her hands pressed to her breast. A telegram, the book. Oh, but of course she'd been in time. Of course. Why should offer the man two hundred pounds? She lay down laughing at herself, forcing herself to try and sleep. End of Book 4, Chapter 18《Part 4, Chapter 19 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 4 Chapter 19 Sir Richard Lister unfolded his times with a jerk. A beastly rheumatic hole, I call this, he said, 
looking angrily at the window of his hotel sitting room, which showed drops from a light shower then passing across the lagoon. And the dilatoriousness of these Italian posts is upon my soul beyond bearing. This time it is three days old. Mary Lister looked up from the letter she was writing. Why don't you read the French papers, Papa? I saw a figure of yesterday in the piazza this morning. Because I can't, was the indignant reply. There wasn't the same amount of money squandered on my education, my dear, that there has been on yours. Mary smiled a little, unseen. Her father had been, of course, at Eton. She had been educated by a succession of small and hunted governesses, mostly Swiss, whose remuneration had certainly counted among the frugalities rather than the extravagances of the family budget. Sir Richard read his times for a while. Mary continued to write cheques for the board wages of the servants left at home, and to give directions for the beating of carpets and cleaning of curtains. It was dull work, and she detested it. Presently Sir Richard arose with a stretch. He was a tall old man, with a shock of white hair and very black eyes. A victim to certain obscure forms of gout, he was in character neither stupid nor inhuman, but he suffered from the usual drawbacks of his class. Too much money and too few ideas. He came abroad every year, reluctantly. He did not choose to be left behind by county neighbours whose wives talked nonsense about Botticelli. And Mary would have it. But Sir Richard's tours were generally one prolonged course of battle between himself and all foreign institutions. And if it was Mary who drove him forth, it was Mary also who generally hurried him home. Who was it you saw last night in that ridiculous singing affair? He asked, as he put the fire together. Kitty Ash and her mother, said Mary, after a moment, still writing. Her mother? What, that disreputable woman? They weren't in the same gondola. Ash will be a great fool if he lets his wife see much of that woman. By all accounts, Lady Kitty is quite enough of a handful already. By the way, have you found out where they are? On the Grand Canal. Shall we call this afternoon? I don't mind. Of course, I think Ash is doing an immense amount of harm. Well, you can tell him so, said Mary. Sir Richard frowned. His daughter's manners seemed to him, at times, abrupt. Why do you see so little now of Elizabeth Trammell? He asked her with a sharp look. You used to be always there. And I don't believe you even write to her much now. Does she see much of anybody? Because you mean of Trammell's condition... What good can she be to him now? He knows nobody. She doesn't seem to ask the question, said Mary dryly. A queer, soft look came over Sir Richard's old face. No, the women don't, he said half to himself, and fell into a little reverie. He emerged from it with the remark, accompanied by a smile, a little sly but not unkind. I always used to hope, Polly, that you and Ash would have made it up. I'm sure I don't know why said Mary, fastening up her envelopes. As she did so, it crossed her father's mind that she was still very good-looking. Her dress of dark blue cloth, the plain fashion of her brown hair, her oval face and well-marked features, her plump and pretty hands, were all pleasant to look upon. She had rather a hard way with her, though, at times. The servants were always giving warning. And personally, he was much fonder of his younger daughter, who Mary considered foolish and improvident but he was well aware that Mary made his life easy. Well, you were always on excellent terms, he said, in answer to her last remark. I remember his saying to me once that you were very good company. The bishop, too, used to notice how he liked to talk to you. When Mary and her father were together, the bishop was Sir Richard's property. He only fell to Mary's share in the old man's absence. Mary coloured slightly. Oh, yes, we got on she said, counting her letters a while with a quick hand. Well, I hope that young woman whom he did marry is now behaving herself. It was that fellow Cliff with whom the scandal was last year, wasn't it? There was a good deal of talk, said Mary. A rum fellow, that Cliff. A man at the club told me last week it is believed he had been fighting with those Bosnian rebels for months. Shocking bad form, I call it. If the Turks catch him, they'll string him up. Quite right, too. What's he got to do with other people's quarrels? Yet the Turks will be such brutes. Nonsense, my dear. Don't you believe any of this radical stuff? 
The Turks are awfully fine fellows, fight like bulldogs. And as for the atrocities, they make them up in London. Oh, of course, what Cliff wants is notoriety, we all know that. Well, I'm going out to see if I can find another English paper. Beastly climate. But as Sir Richard turned away to the window, he was met by a burst of sunshine which hit him gaily in the face like a child's impertinence. He grumbled something unintelligible as Mary put him into his Inverness cape, took hat and stick, and departed. Mary sat still beside the writing table, her hands crossed on her lap, her eyes absently bent upon them. She was thinking of the Serenata. She had followed it with an acquaintance from the hotel, and she'd seen not only Kitty and Madame Destre, but also the solitary man in the heavy cloak. She knew quite well that Cliff was in Venice, though, true to her secretive temper, she had not mentioned the fact to her father. Of course he was in Venice, on Kitty's account. It would be too absurd to suppose that he was here by mere coincidence. Mary believed that nothing but the intervention of Cliff's mighty kinsman from the north had saved the situation the year before. Kitty would certainly have betrayed her husband but for the force majeure arrayed against her. And now the magnate who had played Providence slumbered in the family vault. He had passed away in the spring, full of years and honours, leaving Cliff some money. The path was clear. As for the escapade in the Balkans, Geoffrey was, of course, tired of it. A sensational book hurried out to meet the public appetite for horrors, and the pursuance of his intrigue with Lady Kitty Ash. Mary was calmly certain that these were now his objects. He was no doubt writing his book and meeting Kitty where he could. Ash would soon have to go home. And then, as if that girl Margaret French could stop it. Well, William had only got his desserts. But as the thoughts passed from Kitty or Cliff to William Ash, their quality changed. Hatred and a bitterness, scorn or wounded vanity, passed into something gentler. She fell into recollections of Ash as he had appeared on that bygone afternoon in May, when he came back triumphant from his election with the world before him. If he had never seen Kitty Bristol. I should have made him a good wife, she said to herself. I should have known how to be proud of him. And there emerged also the tragic consciousness that if the fates had given him to her, she might have been another woman, taught by happiness, by love, by motherhood. It was that little heartless creature who had snatched them both from her, William and Geoffrey Cliff, the higher and the lower, the man who might have ennobled her, and the man, half charlatan, half genius, whom she might have served and raised by her fortune and her abilities. Her life might have been so full, so interesting, and it was Kitty that had made it flat and cold and featureless. Poor William. Had he really liked her in those boy and girl days? She dreamed over their old cousinly relations, over the presents he had sometimes given her. Then a thought like a burning arrow pierced her, her hands locked, straining one against the other. If the innocent tree were indeed renewed, if Geoffrey succeeded in tempting Kitty from her husband, why then, then... She shivered before the images that were passing through her mind, and, rising, she put away her letters and rang for the waiter to order dinner. Where shall we go? said Kitty languidly, putting down the French novel she was reading. Mr. Ash suggests San Lazaro. Margaret looked up from her writing as Kitty moved towards her. The rain seemed to have all cleared off. Well, I'm sure it doesn't matter where, said Kitty, and was turning away. But Margaret caught her hand and caressed it. Naughty Kitty, why this sea air can't put some more colour into your cheeks, I don't understand. I'm not pale, cried Kitty, pouting. Margaret, you do croak about me so. If you say any more, I'll go and rouge till you're ashamed to go out with me. There. Where's William? William opened the door as she spoke, a Gazetta di Venezia in one hand and a telegram in the other. Something for you, darling, he said, holding it out to Kitty. Shall I open it? Oh, oh no, said Kitty hastily. Give it to me. It's from my Paris woman. Aha, laughed Ash. Some extravagance you want to keep to yourself, I'll be bound. I've a good mind to see. And he teasingly held it up above her head. 
but she gave a little jump, caught it, and ran off with it to her room. Much regret, impossible stock publication, 50 copies distributed already, writing. She dropped, speechless, on the edge of her bed, a crumpled telegram in her hand. The minutes passed. When will you be ready? said Ash, tapping at the door. Is the gondola there? Waiting at the steps. Five minutes. Ash departed. She rose, tore the telegram into little bits, and began with deliberation to put on her mantle and hat. You've got to go through with it, she said to the white face in the glass, and she straightened her small shoulders defiantly. They were bound for the Armenian convent. It was a misty day, with shafts of light on the lagoon. The storm had passed, but the water was still rough, and the clouds seemed to be withdrawing their forces, only to marshal them again with the darkness. A day of sudden bursts of watery light, of bands of purple distance struck into enchanting beauty by the red or orange of a sail, of a wild salt breath in air that seemed to be still fused with spray. The Alps were hidden, but what sun there was played faintly on the Eugenian hills. I say, Margaret, at last she does us some credit, said Ash, pointing to his wife. Margaret started. Was it rouge, or was it the strong air? Kitty's languor had entirely disappeared. She was more cheerful and more talkative than she had been at any time since their arrival. She chattered about the current scandals of Venice, the mysterious Contessa, who lived in the palace opposite their own and only went out in deep mourning at night, because she had been the love of a Russian Grand Duke, and the Grand Duke was dead of the cardist pretender and his wife, who had been very popular in Venice, until they took it into their heads to require royal honours, and Venice, taking time to think, had lazily decided the game was not worth the candle. So now the sulky pair went about alone in a fine gondola, turning glassy eyes on their former acquaintance. Of the needy Marchesa, who had sold a Titian to the Louvre, and had then found himself boycotted by all his kinsfolk in Venice, who were not needy and had no Titians to sell. All these tales Kitty reeled out at length, till the handsome gondoliers marvelled at the little lady's vivacity and the queer brightness of her eyes. Gracious Kitty, where do you get all these stories from? cried Ash, when the chatter paused for a moment. He looked at her with delight, rejoicing in her gaiety, the slight touches of white which today for the first time relieved the sombreness of her dress, the return of her colour. And Margaret wondered again. How much of it was a rouge? At the Armenian convent, a handsome young monk took charge of them. As George Sand and Lamennais had done before them, they looked at the printing press, the garden, the cloister, the church. They marvelled lazily at the cleanliness and brightness of the place, and finally they climbed to the library and museum, and the room close by where Byron played at grammar-making. In this room, Ash fell suddenly into a political talk with the young monk, who was an ardent and patriotic son of the most unfortunate of nations. And they passed out and down the stairs, followed by Margaret French, not noticing that Kitty had lingered behind. Kitty stood idly by the window of Byron's room, thinking restlessly of verses that were not Byron's, though there was in them, clothed in forms of the new age, the spirit of Byronic passion, and more than a touch of Byronic affectation. Thinking also of the morning's telegram. Supposing Daryl's prophecy, which had seemed to her so absurd, came true, that the book did William harm, not good, that he ceased to love her, that he cast her off. A plash of water outside, and a voice giving directions. From the lagoon towards Malamocco, a gondola appeared. A gentleman and lady were seated in it. The lady, a very handsome Italian with a loud laugh and brilliant eyes, carried a scarlet parasol. Kitty gave a stifled cry as she drew back. She flew out of the room and overtook the other two. May we go back into the garden a little? She said hurriedly to the monk who was talking to William. I should like to see the view towards Venice. William held up a watch to show that there was but just time to get back to the piazza for lunch. Kitty persisted, and the monk, understanding what the impetuous young lady wished, good-naturedly turned to obey her. We must be very quick, said Kitty. Take us, please, to the edge beyond the trees. And she herself hurried through the garden to its farther side, where it was bounded by the lagoon. 
the others followed her, rather puzzled by her caprice. Not much to be seen, darling, said Ash, as they reached the water, and I think this good man wants to get rid of us. And indeed the monk was looking backward across the intervening trees at a party which had just entered the garden. Ah, they have found another brother, he said politely, and he began to point out to Kitty the various landmarks visible, the arsenal, the two asylums, San Pietro di Castello. The newcomers just glanced at the garden, apparently, as the ashes had done on arrival, and promptly followed their guide back into the convent. Kitty asked a few more questions, then led the way in a hasty return to the garden door, the entrance hall, and the steps where their gondola was waiting. Nothing was to be seen of the second party. They had passed on into the cloisters. Animation, oddity, inconsequence. All these things Margaret observed in Kitty during luncheon in the restaurant of the Macaria, and various incidents connected with it. Animation, above all. The Ashes fell in with acquaintance, a fashionable and harassed mother on the fringe of the archangels, accompanied by two daughters, one pretty and one plain, and sore pressed by their demands, real or supposed. The parents were not rich, but the girls had to be dressed, taken abroad, produced at country houses at Ascot and the Opera, like all other girls. The eldest girl, a considerable beauty, was an accomplished egotist at nineteen, and regarded her mother as a rather inefficient dame de compagnie. Kitty understood this young lady perfectly, and after luncheon, over her cigarette, her little sharp probing questions gave the beauty twenty minutes' annoyance. Then appeared a young man, ill-dressed, red-haired, and shy. Carelessly, as he greeted the mother and daughters, his entrance, however, transformed them. The mother forgot fatigue, the beauty ceased to yawn. The younger girl, who had been making surreptitious notes of Kitty's costume in the last leaf of her guidebook, developed a charming gush. He was the owner of the Magellan Estates and the historic Magellan Castle, a professed hater of absurd womankind, and in general a hunted and self-conscious person. Kitty gave him one finger, looked him up and down, asked him whether he was yet engaged, and when he laughed and embarrassed him, no, told him that he would certainly die in the arms of the Magellan housekeeper. This got a smile out of him. He sat down beside her, and the two laughed and talked with a freedom which presently drew the attention of the neighbouring tables and made Ash uncomfortable. He rose, paid the bill, and succeeded in carrying the whole party off to the piazza in search of coffee. But here again Kitty's extravagances, the provocation of her light loveliness as she sat toying with a fresh cigarette and chafing at Lord Magellan, drew a disagreeable amount of notice from the Italians passing by. "'Mother, let's go!' said the angry beauty, imperiously in her mother's ear. I don't like to be seen with Lady Kitty. She's impossible. And with cold farewells, the three ladies departed. Then Kitty sprang up and threw away her cigarette. How those girls bully their mother, she said with scorn. However, it serves her right. I'm sure she bullied hers. Well, now we must go and do something. Ta-da! Lord Magellan, to whom she offered another casual finger, wanted to know why he was dismissed. If they were going sightseeing, might he not come with them? Oh, no, said Kitty calmly. Sightseeing with people you don't really know is too trying to the temper. Even with one's best friend, it's risky. Where are you? May I call? said the young man. We're always out, was Kitty's careless reply. But, she considered, would you like to see the Palazzo Vercelli? The magnificent place on the Grand Canal? Very much. Meet me there tomorrow afternoon, said Kitty. Four o'clock. Delighted, said Lord McGillan, making a note on his shirt cuff. And who lives there? My mother, said Kitty abruptly, and walked away. Ash followed her in discomfort. This young man was the son of a certain Lady McGillan, an intimate friend of Lady Tramwell's, one of the noblest women of her generation, pure, high-minded, spiritual, to whom neither an ugly word nor thought was possible. It annoyed him that either he or Kitty should be introducing her son to Madame Destre. It was really tiresome of Kitty. Rich young men with characters yet indeterminate were not to be likely brought in contact with Madame Destre. Kitty could not be ignorant of it, poor child. 
It had been one of her reckless strokes, and Ash was conscious of a sharp annoyance. However, he said nothing. He followed his companions from church to church, till pictures became an abomination to him. Then he pleaded letters and went to the club. "'Will you call on Maman tomorrow?' said Kitty as he turned away, looking at him a little askance. She knew that he had disapproved of her invitation to Lord Magellan. Why had she given it? She didn't know. There seemed to be a kind of revived mischief and fever in the blood, driving her to these foolish and ill-considered things. Ash met her question with a shake of the head and the remark in a decided tone that he should be too busy. Privately, he thought it a piece of impertinence that Madame Destre should expect either Kitty or himself to appear in her drawing-room at all. That this implied a complete transformation of his earlier attitude, he was well aware. He accepted it with a curious philosophy. When he and Kitty first met, he had never troubled his head about such things. If a woman amused or interested him in society, so long as his taste was satisfied, she might have as much or as little character as she pleased. It stirred his mocking sense of English hypocrisy that the point should be even raised. But now, how can any individual, he asked himself, with political work to do, affect to despise the opinions and prejudices of society? A politician with great reforms to put through will make no friction round him that he can avoid, unless he is a fool. It weighed sorely, therefore, on his present mind that Madame Destre was in Venice, that she was a person of blemished repute, that he must be, and was, ashamed of her. It would have been altogether out of consonance with his character to put any obstacle in the way of Kitty's seeing her mother. But he chafed, as he had never yet chafed, under the humiliation of his relationship to the notorious Margaret Fitzgerald of the Forties, who had been old Blackwater's cher ami before she married him, and, as Lady Blackwater, had sacrificed her innocent and defenceless stepdaughter to one of her own lovers, in order to secure for him the stepdaughter's fortune. Black and dastardly deed. Was it all part of the general growth and concentration that any shrewd observer might have read in William Ash? The pressure, enormous, unseen, of the traditional English ideals, English standards, asserting itself at last in a brilliant and paradoxical nature. It had been so, conspicuously, in the case of one of his political predecessors. Lord Melbourne had begun his career as a person of idle habits and imprudent adventures, much given to coarse conversation, and unable to say the simplest thing without an oath. He ended it as the man of scrupulous dignity, tact and delicacy, who moulded the innocent youth of a girl queen to his own lasting honour and England's gratitude. In ways less striking, the same influence of vast responsibilities was perhaps acting upon William Ash. It had already made him a sterner, tougher, and, no doubt, a greater man. The defection of William only left Kitty, it seemed, still more greedy of things to see and do. Innumerable sacristans opened all possible doors, and unveiled all possible pictures. Bellini succeeded Tintoret, and Carpaccio Bellini. The two sable gondoliers wore themselves out in Kitty's service, and Margaret's kind, round face grew more and more puzzled and distressed. And whence this strange impression that the whole experience was a flight on Kitty's part, or rather that throughout it she was always eagerly expecting, or eagerly escaping, from some unknown, unseen pursuer. A glance behind her, a start, a sudden shivering gesture in the shadows of dark churches. These things suggested it, till Margaret herself was caught by the same suppressed excitement that seemed to be alive in Kitty. Did it all point merely to some mental state, to the nervous effects of her illness? and her loss. When they reached home about five o'clock, Kitty was naturally tired out. Margaret put her on the sofa, gave her tea, and tended her, hoping that she might drop asleep before dinner. But, just as tea was over, and Kitty was lying curled up, silent and white, with that brooding look which kept Margaret's anxiety about her constantly alive, there was a sudden sound of voices in the anteroom outside. Margaret, cried Kitty, starting up in dismay, Say I'm not at home. Too late. Their smiling Italian housemaid threw the door open 
with the air of one bringing good fortune. And behind her there appeared a tall lady and an old gentleman hat in hand. Maybe come in, Kitty, said Mary Lister advancing. Cousin Elizabeth told us you were here. Kitty had sprung up. The disorder of her fair hair, her white cheeks, and the ghostly thinness of her small black-robed form drew the curious eyes of Sir Richard. And the oddness of her manner as she greeted them only confirmed the old man's prejudice against her. However, greeted they were, in some sort of fashion, and Miss French gave them tea. She kept Sir Richard entertained while Kitty and Mary conversed. They talked perfunctorily of ordinary topics, Venice, its sites, its hotels, and the people staying in them, of Lady Tranmore and various ash relations. Meanwhile, the inmost thought of each was busy with the other. Kitty studied the lines of Mary's face and the fashion of her dress. She looks much older, and she's not enjoying her life a bit. That's my fault. I spoiled all her chances with Geoffrey, and she knows it. She hates me. Quite right, too. Oh, you mean that nonsensical thing last night? Sir Richard was saying to Margaret French. Oh, no, I didn't go. But Mary, of course, thought she must go. Somebody invited her. Kitty started. You were at the Serenata, she said to Mary. Yes, I went with a party from the hotel. Kitty looked at her. A sudden flush had touched her pale cheeks, and she could not conceal the trembling of her hands. That was marvellous, that light on the Salute, wasn't it? Wonderful. And on the water, too. I saw two or three people I knew who just caught their faces for a second. Did you? said Kitty. Her thoughts ran fast through her head. Did she see Geoffrey? And does she mean me to understand that she did? How she detests me. If she did see him, of course she supposes that I know all about it, and that he's here for me. Why don't I ask her straight out whether she saw him, and make her understand that I don't care tuppence, that she's welcome to him, as far as I'm concerned? But some hidden feeling tied her tongue. Mary continued to talk about the serenata, and Kitty was presently conscious that her every word and gesture in reply was closely watched. Yes, yes, she saw him. Perhaps you'll tell William, or, or write home to Mother. And in her excitement she began to chatter, fast and loudly, mostly to Sir Richard, repeating some of the Venice tales she had told in the gondola, with much inconsequence and extravagance. The old man listened, his hands on his stick, his eyes on the ground, the expression on his strong mouth hostile or sarcastic. It was a relief to everybody when Ash's step was heard stumbling up the dark stairs, and the door opened on his friendly and courteous present. Why, Polly, and Cousin Richard, I wondered where you had hidden yourselves. Mary's bright, involuntary smile transformed her. Ash sat down beside her, and they were soon deep in all sorts of gossip, relations, acquaintance, politics, and what not. All Mary's stiffness disappeared. She became the elegant, agreeable woman of whom dinner parties would lad. Ash plunged into the pleasant malice of her talk, which ranged through the good and evil fortunes, mostly the latter, of half his acquaintance, discussed the debts, the love affairs, and the follies of his political colleagues or parliamentary foes, how the foreign secretary had been getting on at Balmoral, how so-and-so had been ruined at the Derby and restored to sanity and solvency by the Oaks, how Lady Parham at Hatfield had been made to know her place by the French ambassador, and the like, passing thereby a charming half-hour. Meanwhile, Kitty, Margaret French, and Sir Richard kept up intermittent remarks, pausing at every other phrase to gather the crumbs that fell from the table of the other two. Kitty was very weary, and a dead weight had fallen on her spirits. If Sir Richard had thought her bad form ten minutes before, his unspoken mind now declared her stupid. Meanwhile, Kitty was saying to herself, as she watched her husband and Mary, I used to amuse William just as well last year. When the door closed on them, Kitty fell back on her cushions with an ugh of relief. William came back in a few minutes from showing the visitors the back way to their hotel, and stood beside his wife with an anxious face. They were too much for you, darling. They stayed too long. How you and Mary chattered, said Kitty with a little pout. And at the same moment she slipped an appealing hand into his. Ash clasped the hand and laughed. 
I always told you she was an excellent gossip. Sir Richard and Mary pursued their way through the narrow calliers that led to the piazza. Sir Richard was expatiating on Ash's folly in marrying such a wife. She looks like an actress, and as to her conversation, she began by telling me outrageous stories, and ended by not having a word to say about anything. Bad blood of the Bristols, it seems to me, without their brains. Oh no, Papa, Kitty is very clever. You haven't heard her recite. She was tired tonight. Well, I don't want to flatter you, my dear, said the old man testily, but I thought it was pathetic, the way in which Ash enjoyed your conversation. It showed you didn't get much of it at home. Mary smiled uncertainly. Her whole nature was still aglow from that contact with Ash's delightful personality. After months of depression and humiliation, her success with him had somehow restored those illusions on which cheerfulness depends. How ill Kitty looked, and how conscious. Mary was impetuously certain that Kitty had betrayed her knowledge of Cliff's presence in Venice, and equally certain that William knew nothing. Poor William! Well, what can you expect of such a temperament, such a race? Mary's thoughts travelled confusedly towards her, and through some big and dreadful catastrophe. And then, after it? It seemed to her that she was once more in the Park Lane drawing-room, the familiar Morris papers and Burne Jones drawings surrounding her. And she and Elizabeth Trammell sat hand in hand, talking of William, a William once more free, after much folly and suffering, to reconstruct his life. Here we are said Sir Richard's Lister, moving down a dark passage towards the brightly lit doorway of their hotel. With a start, as of one taken red-handed, Mary awoke from her dream. End of Part 4 Chapter 19Part 4, Chapter 20 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 4, Chapter 20. Madame Destre and her friend Donna Laura occupied the mezzanine of the vast Vercelli Palace. The palace itself belonged to the head of the Vercelli family. It was a magnificent erection of the late 17th century, at this moment half furnished, dilapidated, and forsaken. But the entresol on the eastern side of the Cotille was in good condition, and comfortably fitted up for the occasional use of the Principe. As he was wintering in Paris, he had let his rooms at an ordinary commercial rent to his kinswoman, Donna Laura. She, a soured and melancholy woman, unmarried in a Latin society which has small use for kindness for spinsters, had seized on Marguerite Destre, whose acquaintance she had made in a Mont d'Or hotel and was now keeping her like a caged canary that sings for its food. Madame Destre was quite willing, so long as she had a sofa on which to, to sit enthroned, a sufficiency of new gowns, a maid, cigarettes, breakfast in bed, and a supply of French novels, she appeared the most harmless and engaging of mortals. Her youth had been cruel, disorderly, and vicious. It had lasted long. But now, when middle age stood at last confessed, she was lapsing, it seemed, into amiability and good behaviour. She was indeed fast forgetting her own history, and soon the recital of it would surprise no one so much as herself. It was five o'clock. Madame Dresdre had just established herself in the silk panelled drawing room of Donna Laura's apartment, expectant of visitors, and in particular of her daughter. In begging Kitty to come on this particular afternoon, she had not thought fit to mention that it would be Donna Laura's day. Had she done so, Kitty, in consideration of her mourning, would perhaps have cried off. Whereas really, poor dear child, what she wanted was distraction and amusement. And what Madame Destre wanted was the presence beside her, in public, of Lady Kitty Ash. Kitty had already visited her mother privately, and had explored the antiquities of the Vercelli Palace but Madame Destre was now intent on something more and different. For in the four years which had now elapsed since the Ashes' marriage, this lively lady had known adversity. She had been forced to leave London, as we have seen, 
by the pressure of certain facts in her past history so ancient and far removed when their true punishment began, that she no doubt felt it highly unjust that she should be punished for them at all. Her London debts had swallowed up what there remained to her of fortune, and afterwards the allowance from the ashes was all she had to depend on. Banished to Paris, she fell into a lower stratum of life, at a moment when her faithful and mysterious friend, Markham Warrington, was held in Scotland by the first painful symptoms of his sister's last illness, and could do but little for her. She had, in fact, known the sordid shifts and straits of poverty, though the smallest moral effort would have saved her from them. She had kept disreputable company, she had been miserable and base, and although shame is not easy to persons of her temperament, it may perhaps be said that she was ashamed of this period of her existence. Appeals to the ashes yielded less and less, and Warrington seemed to have forsaken her. She woke at last to a panic-stricken fear of darker possibilities and more real suffering than any she had yet known, and under the stress of this fear she collapsed physically, writing both to Warrington and to the ashes in a tone of mingled reproach and despair. The ashes sent money, and, though Kitty was not at the moment fit to travel, prepared to come. Warrington, who had just closed the eyes of his sister, went at once. He was now the last of his family, without any ties that he could not lawfully break. Within two days of his arrival in Paris, Madame Destre had promised to marry him in three months, to break off all her Paris associations, and to give her life henceforward into his somewhat stern hands. The visit to Venice was part of the price that he had had to pay for her decision. Marguerite pleaded, with a shudder, that she must have a little amusement before she went to live in Dumfriesshire and he had been obliged to acquiesce in her arrangement with Donna Laura, stipulating only that he should be their escort and guardian. What had moved him to such an act? His reasons can only be guessed at. Warrington was a man of religion, a Calvinist by education and inheritance, and of a silent and dreamy temperament. He had been intimate with very few women in his life. His sister had been a second mother to him, and both of them had been the guardians of their younger brother. When this adored brother fell, shot through the lungs in the hopeless defence of Lady Blackwater's reputation, it would have been natural enough that Markham should hate the woman who had been the occasion of such a calamity. The sister, a pious and devoted Christian, had indeed hated her, properly and duly, and thenceforward. Markham, on the contrary, accepted his brother's last commission without reluctance. In this matter, at least, Lady Blackwater had not been directly to blame. His mind acquitted her, and her soft, distressed beauty touched his heart. Before he knew where he was, she had made an impression upon him that was to be lifelong. Then gradually he awoke to a full knowledge of her character. He suffered, but otherwise it made no difference. Finding it was then impossible to persuade her to marry him, he watched over her as best he could for some years, passing through phases of alternate hope and disgust. His sister's affection for him was clouded by his strange relation to the Jezebel, who, in her opinion, had destroyed their brother. He could not help it. He could only do his best to meet both claims upon him. During her lingering passage to the grave, his sister had nearly severed him from Marguerite d'Estre. She died, however, just in time, and now here he was in Venice, passing through what seemed to him one of the ante-rooms of life leading to no very radiant beyond. But, radiant or no, his path lay thither. And at the same time he saw that, although Marguerite felt him to be her only refuge from poverty and disgrace, she was painfully afraid of him, and afraid of the life into which he was leading her. The first guest of the afternoon proved to be Louis Harmon, the painter and dilettante, who had been in former days one of the habitués of the house in St James's Place. This perfectly correct, yet tolerant gentleman, was wintering in Venice in order to copy the Carpaccios in San Giorgio di Scivioni. His copies were not good, but they were all promised to artistic fair ladies, and the days which the painter spent upon them were happy and harmless. He came in gaily, delighted to see Madame d'Estre in flourishing circumstances again, delivered apparently from the abyss into which he had found her sliding 
on the occasion of various chance visits of his own to Paris. Warrington's doing, apparently. Queer fellow. Well, I saw Lady Kitty in the piazza this afternoon, he said, as he sat down beside his hostess. Donna Laura had not yet appeared. Very thin and fragile, but by Jove, how these English beauties hold their own. Irish, if you please, said Madame Destre, smiling. Harmon bowed to her correction, admiring at the same time both the toilette and the good looks of his companion. Dropping his voice, he asked with a gingerly and sympathetic air whether all was now well with the ash menage. He'd been sorry to hear certain gossip of the year before. Madame Destre laughed. Yes, she understood that Kitty had behaved like a little goose with that poseur cliff. But that was all over, long ago. Why, the silly child has everything she wants. William is devoted to her, and it can't be long before he succeeds. No need to go trifling with poets, said Harmon, smiling. By the by, do you know that Geoffrey Cliff is in Venice? Madame d'Estre opened her eyes. Is he possible? Oh, but Kitty has forgotten all about him. Of course, said Harmon. I'm told he's been seen with the Ritchie. Madame d'Estre raised her shoulders this time in addition to her eyes. Then her face clouded. I believe, she said slowly, that woman may come here this afternoon. Is she a friend of yours? Harmon's tone expressed his surprise. I, I knew her in Paris, said Madame d'Estre with some hesitation, when she was a student at the Conservatoire. She and I had some common acquaintance, and now, frankly, I daren't offend her. She has the most appalling temper, and she sticks at nothing. Harmon wondered what the exact truth of this might be, but did not inquire. And as guests, including Colonel Warrington, began to arrive, and Donna Laura appeared and began to, to dispense tea, the tete-a-tete -tete was interrupted. Donna Laura's salon was soon well filled, and Harmon watched the gathering with curiosity. As far as it concerned Madame Destre, and she was clearly the main attraction which had brought it together, it represented, he saw, a phase of social recovery. A few prominent Englishmen, passing through Venice, came in without their wives, making perfunctory excuse for the absence of their ladies. But the cosmopolitans of all kinds who crowded in, Anglo-Italians, foreign diplomats, travellers of many sorts, and a few restless Venetians, bearing the great names of old, to whom their own Venice was little more than a place of occasional sojourn, made satisfactory amends for these persons of too long memories. In all these travellers' towns, Venice, Rome and Florence, there is indeed a society, and a very agreeable society, which is wholly irresponsible and asks few or no questions. The elements of it meet as strangers, and as strangers they mostly part. But between the meeting and the parting, there lies a moment, all the gayer perhaps, because of its social uncertainty and freedom. Madame d'Estre was profiting by it to the full. She was in excellent spirits and talk. Bright rose carnations shone in the bosom of her dress. One white arm, bared to the elbow, lay stretched carelessly on the fine cut velvet which covered the gilt sofa, part of a suite of Venetian Louis Cars, clumsily gorgeous, on which she sat. The other hand pulled the ears of a toy spaniel. On the ceiling above her, Tiepolo had painted a headlong group of sensuous forms, alive with vulgar movement and passion. The putti and the goddesses, peering through aerial balustrades, looked down complacently on Madame d'Estre. Meanwhile there stood behind her, a silent, distinguished figure, the man of whom Harmon saw that she was always nervously, and sometimes timidly, conscious. Harmon had been reading Molière's Don Juan. The sentinel figure of Warrington mingled in his imagination with the statue of the commander. Or again, he was tickled by a vision of Madame Destre's grown old, living in a Scotch house, turreted and severe, tended by servants of the Ordre Licht, or shivering under a faithful minister on Sundays. Had she any idea of the sort of fold towards which Warrington, a once covenanter and man of the world, was carrying his lost sheep? The sheep, however, was still gambling at large. Occasionally a guest appeared who proved it. For instance, at a certain tumultuous entrance, billowing skirts, vast hat and high-pitched voice all combining in the effect, Madame Destre's flushed violently, 
Warrington's stiffness redoubled. On the threshold stood the young actress Mademoiselle Ricci, a Marseillaise, half French, half Italian, who was at the moment the talk of Venice. Why would take too long to tell? It was by no means mostly due to her talent, which, however, was displayed at the Apollo Theatre two or three times a week, and was no doubt considerable. She was a flamboyant lady, with astonishing black eyes, a too transparent white dress, over which was slung a small black mantilla, a scarlet hat and parasol, and a startling fan of the same colour. Both before and after her greeting of Madame d'Estre, whom she called her Chérie and her Belle Marguerite, she created a whirlwind in the salon. She was noisy, rude and false. It could only be said on the other side that she was handsome, for those who admired the kind of thing, and famous, more or less. The intimacy of the party was broken up by her, for wherever she was, she brought uproar, and it was impossible to forget her. And this uneasy attention which she compelled was at its height when the door was once more thrown open for the entrance of Lady Kitty Ash. Ah, my darling Kitty! cried Madame d'Estre, rising in a soft enthusiasm. Kitty came in slowly, holding herself very erect, a delicate and distinguished figure in her deep mourning. She frowned as she saw the crowd in the room. I'll come another time, she said hastily to her mother, beginning to retreat. Oh, Kitty, cried Madame d'Estre in distress, holding her fast. At that moment, Harmon, who was watching them both with keenness, saw that Kitty had perceived Mademoiselle Ricci. The actress had paused in her chatter to stare at the newcomer. She sat fronting the entrance, her head insolently thrown back, knees crossed, a cigarette poised in the plump and dimpled hand. A start ran through Kitty's small person. She allowed her mother to lead her in and introduce her to Donna Laura. Aha, my lady, said Harmon to himself. Are you perhaps interested in the Ricci? Is it possible even that you have seen her before? Kitty, however, betrayed herself to no one else. To other people it was only evident that she did not mean to be introduced to the actress. She pointedly and sharply avoided it. This was interpreted as aristocratic hauteur and did her no harm. On the contrary, she was soon chattering French with a group of diplomats and the centre of the most animated group in the room. All the newcomers who could attached themselves to it, and the actress found herself presently almost deserted. She put up her eyeglass, studied Kitty impertinently, and asked a man sitting near her for the name of the strange lady. Isn't she lovely, my little Kitty? said Madame d'Estre, in the ears of a Bavarian baron, who was also much occupied in staring at the small beauty in black. I may say it, though I am her mother, and my son-in-law too. Have you seen him? Such a handsome fellow, and such a dear, so kind to me. They say you know that he will be Prime Minister. The Baron bowed ironically, and inquired who the gentleman might be. He had not caught Kitty's name, and Madame d'Estres had been for some time labelled in his mind as something very near to an adventuress. Madame d'Estres eagerly explained, and he bowed again, with a difference. He was a man of great intelligence, acquainted with English politics. So that was really the wife of the man to whose personality in future the London correspondent of the Allgemeine Zeitung had, within the preceding week, devoted a particularly interesting article, which he had read with attention. His estimate of Madame d'Estre's place in the world altered at once. Yet it was strange that she, or, or rather Donna Laura, should admit such a person as Mademoiselle Ricci to their salon. The mother, indeed, that afternoon, had much reason to be socially grateful to the daughter. Curious contrast with the days when Kitty had been the mere troublesome appendage of her mother's life. It was clear to Marguerite d'Estre now that if she was to accept restraint and a virtuous living, if she was to submit to this marriage she dreaded, yet saw no way to escape, her best link with the gay world in the future might well be through the ashes. Kitty could do a great deal for her. Let her cultivate Kitty, and begin perhaps by convincing William Ash on this present occasion that for once she was not going to ask him for money. In the height of the party, Lord Magellan appeared. Madame Lestre at first looked at him with bewilderment, till Kitty, shaking herself free, came hastily forward to introduce him. 
At the name, the mother's face flashed into smiles. The ramifications of two or three aristocraties represented the only subject she might be said to know. Dear Kitty. Lord McGowan, after Madame Destre had talked to him about his family in a few light and skilful phrases, which suggested knowledge, while avoiding flattery, was introduced to the Bavarian Baron and a French naval officer. But he was not interesting to them, nor they to him. Kitty was surrounded and unapproachable, and a flood of new arrivals distracted Madame Destre's attention. The Ricci, who had noticed the restrained empressement of his reception, pounced on the young man, taming her ways and gestures to what she supposed to be his English prudery, and produced an immediate effect upon him. Lord McGowan, who was only done with English marriageable girls, allowed himself to be amused, and threw himself into a low chair by the actress, a capture, apparently, for the afternoon. Louis Harmon was sitting behind Kitty, a little to her right. He saw her watching the actress and her companion, noticed a compression of the lip, a flash in the eye. She sprang up, said she must go home, and practically dissolved the party. Mademoiselle Ritchie, who had also risen, proposed to Lord Magellan that she should take him in her gondola to the shop of a famous dealer on the canal. Thank you very much, said Lord Magellan, irresolute, and he looked at Kitty. The look apparently decided him, for he immediately added that he had, unfortunately, an engagement in the opposite direction. The actress, angry, drew herself up and proposed a later appointment. Then Kitty carelessly intervened. Do you remember that you promised to see me home? she said to the young man. Don't if it bores you. Lord McGillan eagerly protested. Kitty moved away, and he followed her. Cher madame, would you present me to your daughter? said Ricci in an unnecessarily loud voice. Madame Destre, with a flurried gesture, touched Kitty on the arm. Kitty, Mademoiselle Ricci. Kitty took no notice. Madame Destre said quickly in a low, imploring voice, Please, dear Kitty, I'll explain. Kitty turned abruptly, looked at her mother, and at the woman to whom she was to be introduced. Ah, comme elle est charmante! cried the actress with an inflection of irony in her strident voice. Milady, il faut absolument que nous nous connaissons. Je connais votre chère mère depuis si longtemps. À Paris, l'hiver passé, c'était une amitié des plus tendres. The nasal drag she gave to the words was partly natural, partly insolent. Madame Destre bit her lip. Oui, said Kitty indifferently. Je n'en avais jamais entendu parler. Her brilliant eyes studied the woman before her. She has some hold on Maman, she said to herself in disgust. She knows of something shady that Maman has done. Then another thought stung her, and with a most indifferent bow, triumphing in the evident offence that she was giving, she turned to Lord McGowan. You'd like to see the palazzo? Warrington at once offered himself as a guide. But Kitty declared she knew the way would just show Lord Magellan the piano nobile, dismiss him at the grand staircase, and return. Lord Magellan made his farewells. As Kitty passed through the door of the salon, while the young man held back the velvet portiere which hung over it, she was aware that Mademoiselle Ritchie was watching her. The Marseillaise was leaning heavily on a fauteuil, supported by a hand behind her. A slow, disdainful smile played about her lips. Some evil, threatening thought expressed itself through every feature of her rounded, coarsened beauty. Kitty's sharp look met hers, and the curtain dropped. Don't please let that woman take you anywhere to see anything, said Kitty with energy to her companion, as they walked through the rooms of the Mezzanino. Lord McGowan laughed. What's the matter with her? Oh, nothing said Kitty impatiently, except that she's wicked and common and a snake, and, and your mother would have a fit if she knew you had anything to do with her. The red-haired youth looked grave. Thank you, Lady Kitty, he said quietly. I'll take your advice. Oh, I say, what a nice boy you are, cried Kitty impulsively, laying a hand a moment on his shoulder. And then, as though his filial instinct had awakened hers, she added with hasty falsehood, Maman, of course, knows nothing about her. That was just bluff, what she said. But Donna Laura oughtn't to ask such people. There, that's the way. 
and she pointed to a small staircase in the wall, whereof the trapdoor at the top was open. They climbed it, and found themselves at once in one of the great rooms of the Piano Nobile, to which this quick and easy access from the inhabited entresol had been but recently contrived. "'What a marvellous place!' cried Lord Magellan, looking round him. They were in the principal apartment of the famous Vercelli Palace, a legacy for one of those classical architects whose work may be seen in the late seventeenth-century buildings of Venice. The rooms, enormously high, panelled here and there in tattered velvets and brocades, or frescoed in fast-fading scenes of old Venetian life, stretched in bewildering succession on either side of a central passage or broad corridor, all of them leading at last, on the northern side, to a vast hall painted in architectural perspective by the pupils of Tiepolo, and overarched by a ceiling in which the master himself had massed a multitude of forms equal to Rubens in variety and facility of design, expressed in a thin trenchancy of style. Figures recalling the ancient triumphs and possessions of Venice, in days when she sat dishonoured and despoiled, crowded the coved roof, the painted cornices and pediments. Gaily coloured birds hovered in blue skies. Philosophers and poets in grise made a strange background for large-limbed beauties couched on roses, or young warriors amid trophies of shiny arms. And while all this garrulous commonplace lived and breathed above, the walls below, cold in colour and academic in treatment, maintained as best they could the dignity of the vast place, thus giving up to one of the greatest of artists and emptiest of minds. On the floor of this magnificent hall stood a few old and broken chairs, but the candelabra of glass and ormolu hanging from the ceiling were very nearly at the date of the palace, and superb. Meanwhile, through a faded taffeta of a golden-brown shade, the afternoon light from the high windows to the southwest poured into the stately room. "'How it dwarfs us,' said Lord Pagellon, looking at his companion. "'One feels the merest pygmy.' From the age of decadence, indeed. He glanced at the guidebook in his hand. Good heavens, if this was their decay, what was their bloom? Yes, it's big, and jolly. I like it, said Kitty absently. Then she recollected herself. This is your way out. Federigo, she called to an old man, the custode of the palace, who appeared at the magnificent door leading to the grand staircase. Commander Eccellenza! The old man bent and feeble approached. He carried a watering pot wherewith he was about to minister to some straggling flowers in the windows fronting the Grand Canal. A thin cat rubbed itself against his legs. As he stood in his shabbiness under the high carved door, the only permanent denizen of the building, he seemed an embodiment of the old shrunken Venetian life, still haunting a city it was no longer strong enough to use. Will you show the signor the way out? said Kitty, in tourist Italian. Are you soon shutting up? For the main palazzo, which during the day was often shown to sightseers, was locked at half-past five. Only the two entresol, one tenanted by Donna Laura, the other by the custode, remaining accessible. The old man murmured something which Kitty did not understand, pointing at the same time to a door leading to the interior of the Piano Nobile. Kitty thought that he asked her to be quick, if she wished still to go round the palace. She tried to explain that he might lock up if he pleased. Her way of retreat to the mezzanino down the small staircase was always open. Federigo looked puzzled, again said something in unintelligible Venetian, and led the way to the grand staircase, followed by Lord Magellan. A heavy door clanged below. Kitty was alone. She looked round her, the stretches of marble floor and the streaks of pale sunshine that lay upon its black and white, at the lofty walls painted with a dim, superb architecture, at the crowded ceiling, the gorgeous candelabra. With its costly decoration, the great room suggested a rich and festal life, thronging groups below answering to the Tiepolo groups above, beauties patched and masked. Gallants in brocaded coats, splendid senators, robed like William at the fancy ball. Suddenly she caught sight of herself in one of the high and narrow mirrors that filled the spaces between the windows. In her morning dress, with the light behind her, she made a tiny spectre in the immense hall. The image of her present self, 
frail, black-robed, recalled the two figures in the glass of her Hill Street room, the sparkling white of her goddess dress, and William's smiling face above hers, his arm round her waist. How happy she had been that night! Even her wild fury with Mary Lister seemed to her now a kind of happiness. How gladly she would have exchanged for it either of the two terrors that now possessed her. With a shiver she crossed the hall and pushed her way into the suite of rooms on the northern side. She felt herself in absolute possession of the palace. Federigo no doubt had locked up. Her mother and a few guests were still talking in the salon of the mezzanine, expecting her to return. She would return, soon, but the solitariness and wildness of this deserted place drew her on. Room after room opened before her, bare, save for a few worm-eaten chairs, a fragment of tapestry on the wall, or some tattered portraits in the longy manner, indifferent to begin with, and long since ruined by neglect. Yet here and there a young face looked out, roses in the hair and at the breast, or a doge's cap, and beneath it phantom features, still breathing even in the last decay of canvas and paint, the violence and intrigue of the living man, the ghost of character held there by the ghost of art. Or a lad in slashed brocade, for whom even in this silent palace, and in spite of the gaping crack across his face, life was still young. A cardinal, a nun, a man of letters in clerical dress, the Abbe Provost was his day. Presently she found herself in a wide corridor before a high, closed door. She tried it, and saw a staircase mounting and descending. A passion of curiosity that was half romance, half restlessness, drove her on. She began to ascend the marble steps, hearing only the echo of her own movements, a little afraid of the cold spaces of the vast house, and yet delighting in the fancies that crowded upon her. At the top of the flight she found, of course, another apartment, on the same plan as the one below, but smaller, and less stately. The central hall entered from a door supported by marble caryatids was flagged in yellow marble and frescoed freely with faded eighteenth-century scenes. Cardinals walking in stiff gardens, a pope alighting from his coach surrounded by peasants on their knees, and behind him fountains, an obelisk, and the towering façade of St Peter's. At the moment, thanks to a last glow of light coming in through a west window at the farther end, it was a place Beautiful, though forlorn. But the rooms into which she looked on either side were wreck and desolation itself, crowded with broken furniture, many of them shuttered and dark. As she closed the last door, her attention was caught by a strange bust placed on a pedestal above the entrance. What was wrong with it? An accident? An injury? She went nearer, straining her eyes to see. No, there was no injury. The face indeed was gone, or, or rather, where the face should have been, there now descended a marble veil from brow to breast of the most singular and sinister effect. Otherwise the bust was that of a young and beautiful woman. A pleasing horror seized on Kitty as she looked. Her fancy hunted for the clue. A faithless wife, blotted from her place, made infamous forever by the veil which hid from human eye the beauty she had dishonoured? Or a beloved mistress, on whom the mourning lover could no longer bear to look, the veil an emblem of undying and irremediable grief. Kitty stood enthralled, striving to pierce the ghastly meaning of the bust, when a sound, a distant sound, a shock threw her. She heard a step overhead in the topmost apartment, or mansardi of the palace, a step that presently traversed the whole length of the floor immediately above her head, and began to descend the stair. Strange, Federigo must have shut the great gates by this time, as she had bade him. He himself had inhabited the smaller Montresol on the farther side of the palace, far away. Other inhabitants there were none, so Donna Laura had assured her. The step approached, resonant in the silence. Kitty, seized with nervous fright, turned and ran down the broad staircase by which she had come through the series of deserted rooms in the Piano Nobile till she reached the great hall. There she paused, panting curiosity and daring once more getting the upper hand. The door she had just passed through, which gave access to the staircase, opened again and shut. The stranger, who had entered, came leisurely towards the hall, lingering apparently now and then to look at objects on the way. Presently a voice, 
an exclamation. Kitty retreated, caught up the arm of a chair for support, clung to it, trembling. A man entered, holding his hat in one hand and a small white glove in the other. At sight of the lady in black standing on the other side of the hall, he started violently and stopped. Then, just as Kitty, who had so far made neither sound nor movement, took the first hurried step towards the staircase by which he had entered, Geoffrey Cliff came forward. How do you do, Lady Kitty? Do not, I beg of you, let me disturb you. I had half an hour to spare, and I gave the old man downstairs a prank or two that he might let me wander over this magnificent old place by myself for a bit. I've always had a fancy for deserted houses. You, I gather, have it too. I will not interfere with you for a moment. Before I go, however, let me return what I believe to be your property. He came near her with a studied, deliberate air and held out the white glove. She saw it was her own and accepted it. Thank you. She bowed with all the haughtiness she could muster, though her limbs shook under her. Then as she walked quickly towards the door of exit, Cliff, who was nearer to it than she, also moved towards it and threw it open for her. As she approached him, he said quietly, This is not the first time we have met in Venice, Lady Kitty. She wavered, could not avoid looking at him, and stood arrested. That almost white head, that furrowed brow, those haggard eyes. A slight involuntary cry broke from her lips. Cliff smiled, then he straightened his tall figure. You see, perhaps, that I have not grown younger. You are quite right. I have left my youth, what remained of it, among those splendid fellows whom the Turks have been harrying and torturing. Well, they were worth it. I would give it to them again. There was a short silence. The eyes of each perused the other's face. Kitty began some words and left them unfinished. Cliff resumed in another tone, while the door he held swung gently backward, his hand following it. I spent last winter, as perhaps you know, with the Bosnian insurgents in the mountains. It was a tough business, hardships I should never have had the pluck to face if I had known what was before me. Then in July I got fever. I had to come away to find a doctor, and I was a long time at Kataro pulling round. Meanwhile, the Turks, God blast them, have been at their fiend's work. Half my particular friends, with whom I spent the winter, have been hacked to pieces since I left them. She wavered, held by his look, by the coercion of that mingled passion and indifference with which he spoke. There was in his manner no suggestion whatever of things behind, no reference to herself or to the past between them. His passion, it seemed, was for his comrades, his indifference for her. What had he to do with her any more? He had been among the realities of battle and death while she had been mincing and ambling along the usual feminine path. That was the utterance, it seemed, of the man's whole manner and personality, and nothing could have more effectually recalled Kitty's wild nature to the Lyon. Are you going back? She had turned from him and was pulling up the fingers of the glove he had picked up. Of course, I'm only kicking my heels here till I can collect the money and stores. I and the men I want. I give my orders in London, and I must be here to see to the transshipment of stores and the embarkation of my small force. Not meant for the newspapers, you see, Lady Kitty, in these little details. He drew himself up, smiling, his worn aspect expressing just that mingling of daredevil adventure with subtler and more self-conscious things which gave edge and power to his personality. I heard you were wounded, said Kitty abruptly. So I was, badly. We were defending a Bolche, one of our high mountain valleys, against a beg and his troops. My left arm, he pointed to the black sling on which it was still held, was nearly cut to pieces. However, it is practically well. He took it out of the sling and showed that he could use it. Then his expression changed. He stepped back to the door and opened it ceremoniously. Don't, however, let me delay you, Lady Kitty, by my chatter. Kitty's cheeks were crimson. Her momentary yielding vanished to a passion of scorn. What? He knew that she'd seen him before, seen him with that woman, and he dared to play the mere shattered hero kept in Venice by these crusaders' reasons? 
Have you another volume on the way? She asked him as she advanced. I read your last. Her smile was the smile of an enemy. He eyed her strangely. Did you? That was a waste of time. I think you intended I should read it. He hesitated. Lady Kitty, these things are very far away. I can't defend myself, for they seem wiped out. He crossed his arms and was leaning back against the open door, a fine, rugged figure, by no means repentant. Kitty laughed. You never state the difference. Between the past and the present, what does that mean? She dropped her eyes a moment, then raised them. Do you often go to San Lazaro? He bowed. I had a suspicion that the vision at the window, though it was there only an instant, was you. So you saw Mademoiselle Ricci? His tone was assurance itself. Kitty disdained to answer. Her slight gesture bade him let her pass through, but he ignored it. I find her kind, Lady Kitty. She listens to me. I get sympathy from her. And you want sympathy? Her tone stung him. As a hungry man wants food, as an artist wants beauty. But I know where I shall not get it. That is always a gain, said Kitty, throwing back her head. Mr. Cliff, pray let me bid you good-bye. He suddenly made a step forward. Lady Kitty, his deep-set, imperious eyes searched her face. I can't restrain myself. Your look, your expression, go to my heart. Laugh at me if you like, it's true, but what have you been doing with yourself? He bent towards her, scrutinising every delicate feature, and, as it seemed, shaken with agitation. She breathed fast. Mr. Cliff, you must know that any sympathy from you to me is an insult. Can't you let me pass? He, too, flushed deeply. Insult is a hard word, Lady Kitty. I regret that poem. She swept forward in silence, but he still stood in the way. I read it almost in delirium. Ah, well, he shook his head impatiently. If you don't believe me, let it be. I'm not the man I was. The perspective of things is altered for me. His voice fell. Women and children in their blood, heroic trust, and brute hate, the stars for candles, the high peaks for friends. Those things have come between me and the past. But you're right. We'd better not talk any more. I hear old Federigo coming up the stairs. Good night, Lady Kitty. Good night. He opened the door. She passed him, and to her own intense annoyance, a bunch of pale roses she carried at her belt brushed against the doorway so that one broke and fell. She turned to pick it up, but it was already in Cliff's hand. She held out hers threateningly. I think not. He put it in his pocket. Here is Federigo. Good night. It was quite dark when Kitty reached home. She groped her way upstairs and opened the door of the salon. So weary was she that she dropped into the first chair, not seeing at first that anyone was in the room. Then she caught sight of a brown paper parcel apparently just unfastened on the table, and within it three books of similar shape and size. A movement startled her. William! Ash rose slowly from the deep chair in which he'd been sitting. His aspect seemed to her terrified eyes, utterly and wholly changed. In his hand he held a book like those on the table, and a paper cutter. His face expressed the remote extraction of a man who'd been wrestling his way through some hard contest of the mind. She ran to him. She wound her arms round him. William, William, I didn't mean any harm. I didn't. Oh, I've been so miserable. I tried to stop it. I did all I could. I've hardly slept at all since we talked. You remember? Oh, William, look at me. Don't be angry with me. Ash disengaged himself. I've asked Blanche to pack for me tonight, Kitty. I go home by the early train tomorrow. Oh. She stood, petrified, then a light flashed into her face. You'll buy it all up. You'll stop it, William. Ash drew himself together. I am going home, he said with slow decision, to place my resignation in the hands of Lord Parham. End of Part 4, Chapter 20